Hi everyone, this is Dragon Girl here, and now I'm going to do a reaction to this video titled The Question That Stops Christians in Their Tracks. Now, when I first read this title, I thought, oh, maybe this person is going to debunk Christianity. Oh no, instead, this person is going to teach how manipulative the Christians are when they're preaching to people. In your conversations with other people about uh, Christ and, and Christianity and the real important things, um, you are going to encounter what I call the question. That is the, the question that stops most Christians in their tracks and they don't really quite know how to deal with it. And the question was posed to me in a hour-long TV debate that I had with Deepak Chopra, the New Age guru, as we talked about spiritual things. And what he said to me is, so you're saying that anyone who doesn't believe just like you is going to hell. That's exactly. And that is what the Christians believe. So don't let them bullshit you. Don't let them sit here and try to manipulate you like this guy is going to teach. But that is exactly what they believe. They believe that basically, yep, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. So that's a huge, massive population on earth going to hell for eternity. Now, some people have said if you're, if you're careful how you push the question, you could win any argument. And the problem here is that this was a question about the exclusivity of Christ, a critical issue in Christianity, but it was put in a way that made me look really, really bad. So if I would have answered uh, the question... Because that's the truth. Because, because people can see through the bullshit. That's why. A lot of people can see how manipulative Christianity is. And how it's so closed off, so closed, narrow-minded. How it closes off so many cultures of the world. And that it's... Um, you know, they, they think that Jesus is the only way. And that if any other way, that you're going to hell. So how do you believe such crap? Yes, unless you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, then you will die in your sins, you will go to hell. I would have answered correctly, but I would have really given the wrong impression. I would have fulfilled a really negative stereotype uh, that people have of Christians, and I would have played right into Deepak Chopra's rhetorical hand, and I did not want to do that. And so in that particular circumstance, I sidestepped the issue. And, uh, and went that is a bullshit thing to do, sidestep the issue. When people sidestep the issue, because I watch a lot of debates, it is because they can't answer the question or it's going to make them look bad. And it's going to make their religion look bad and they don't want to look bad. And it, it makes me think that somehow or other they must know that their religion looks bad. And uh, they're going to they're need to face up to this, that, that maybe perhaps your religion is bad. But we can't always sidestep that issue, and nor should we. We need to address it because it's really, really important. But how do we do that? And this is where the tactical approach, I think, is really golden. The tactical uh, approach. Especially using the Colombo tactic in its third sense, and that this is, is... so stupid. You have to use tactical approaches just to answer a simple question. Using questions to make a point. Using questions allows us to make the point in a much more powerful way, especially when we get stuck in a circumstance like this. People asking us about Jesus being the only way of salvation. This happened to me once in a Barnes & Noble where I was giving a presentation for a book I'd written, the Relativism book, and afterwards during the Q&A, someone came up to me and asked the question, why do I need to believe in Jesus? He said, I'm Jewish, I believe in God, I try to live the best life that I can, why do I need Jesus? So there's the question. And the answer is, he doesn't need to believe in Jesus. That he's living a good life. He believes in God. Good. Let him be Let him be Jewish. Let him be himself. What's your damn problem? Again, not as belligerently put as with Deepak Chopra, but the question. Now, here's a case where I want to lead up to the point. I want to make the point by 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 making a couple of steps. I have a choice at this point. I could go ahead and state my steps as part of my argument, put my pieces on the table, so to speak, and then come to a conclusion, which leaves me with a certain liability. 
every time I make a claim that is a stepping stone to my conclusion, the other person, especially if they're a little bit belligerent, can just deny the claim. And now I get nowhere. So instead, I am going to use questions to, to get those pieces placed on the table by the other person. Because if they put those pieces on the table, it's a lot harder for them to take them off, to deny them, okay? Let me show you how that works with the question, all right? And this person there at the Barnes & Noble. I said, when he offered the question, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? No, go right ahead. Here was the first question I asked. Do you think that people who commit moral crimes ought to be punished? In other words, do people who do bad things, should they pay for them? And he said, if they commit crime, crimes, then yes, the, the, the government state laws, then yes, they should, you know, they should go to court, you know, get that figured out. And um, yes. said, well, since I'm a, a prosecuting attorney, yeah, I got lucky on the attorney part, you know, but most people have this sense this deep intuition that people who do wrong things should not get away with them, okay? And so I agreed with him. I agree, I agree that people who do wrong things ought to be punished. So now we... Okay, wait. Now I'm talking about wrong things like, you, you know, um, stealing, like theft, um, robbery, uh, um abuse, um, rape, torture, uh, anything that's harming others, then yes, you know, that should be, people need to uh, go to the court for those things. We've got a piece on the table. He put it there because I asked him the question. Second question, have you ever done any wrong things? See, this is where he, this is where he's, um, making it seem like any tiny little wrong thing is it needs to be punished i i disagree with that because um you know i'm talking about big things you know like someone you know stealing a car someone um raping a lady someone you know shooting out in a grocery store you know those types of things criminal acts going basically things that are going against the law that should be punished. But, but when you're talking about, have you ever done something wrong? That might be very minor things like, Oh shoot, I spilled milk on the table. Well, sh should I go to jail for that? That's personal, right? What do you think he said? He said, yeah, I guess I have. If he, if he would said he didn't do any bad things, I want to talk to his wife, you know? No, of course not. We all know we've done wrong things. I agreed with him. So have I. And then I said, now we got another piece on the table. And so I, I, I said to him, look at where we come just in two questions. We both agree that people who do bad things ought to be punished. And we both agree that we've done those bad things. You know what I call no. that? I said, no. People doing things that are against the law should be punished. But people doing things that... Um, you know, that are just, like I said, minor little things that were, that were not right. And they kind of knew it. That's different. I said to him, what? He said, I said, bad news. This is not a good picture for us. Now, do I need to tell this man he's a sinner? See, I was just going to say, this is where he's going with that. He, this is what he's trying to push. He's trying to push the dumbass viewpoint that people are born sinners, which is bullshit. And this is where he was going with that. He's trying to get you just, just from little things that you've done wrong. He's trying to make you guilty that you're a sinner. And I find that to be the most disgusting, despising aspect of Christianity. No, he just told me. Do I need to tell him that he's under judgment? No, he just told me. Now, he wasn't thinking about that when he walked into the Barnes & Noble. But when I asked him a couple of simple questions that brought these moral intuitions, moral common sense, really, to his 
awareness, he laid them right on the table. Now I've got something to work with. And then I went from there and I explained, it's as if the judge is about to lower the gavel <laughs> on the two of us in the dock. And we both know we're guilty and we both know we deserve what we're going to get. And then the judge pauses and says, by the way, are either of you guys interested in a pardon at this point? Look at when you know you're guilty, you're much more open to an offer of forgiveness. And that's exactly where I wanted to bring him. And then I explained in very simple terms about substitutionary atonement, that the judge took off his robe and got in the dock and took the punishment for us so that we could be set free. I didn't use the language of subst substitution. I just explained it. God is done in Jesus. And that's why Jesus is the only way. He's the only one who solved the problem. Nobody else could do this. Only Jesus could. And that's why we have to put our confidence in him. So what I've done now is I've taken a very tricky situation, the question, and I've, I've approached it using a tactical approach, getting help from the other person to get my pieces on the table so that when I'm going to make my case, now it's much easier to do so in light of what he's helped me to establish. And I don't know if that attorney trusted the Lord or not, but at least I was communicating the gospel to him in, at least in a way that he could understand because now it just wasn't a matter of believing in God and living the best way you could live. We both realize that's not enough. If we're really guilty, then there's got to be a solution to the guilt problem. And that's what Christians offer in Christ. God becoming a man to take the guilt upon himself so that we can be forgiven. That's the reason Jesus is the only way. He's the only one who solved the problem. And this is... Okay. Do you see the serious flaw in what he just said? So he wants you all to feel guilty. He wants you all to feel like you're a sinner and then that that the your pardon is Jesus Christ who died for your sins. This is so dumb logically. Okay, look. Not everyone has done such bad things. Not everyone should be feeling this nasty guilt he's talking about. And what about a child who barely did anything wrong? Should a child be feeling guilty? You're going to teach that child, oh, you're, you're a sinner. You've done so many things wrong. You need, to, you need to pray to Jesus because he's your only hope in life. He's your only savior. And this does not explain anything to do with people's um, positions of birth. Okay. So you have some children who are born practically homeless and in deep poverty. What did the tiny child ever do wrong to be born in such a horrible condition of life? Does, is there some Christian explanation for why, why these children were born with uh, such horrible conditions or maybe born blind or maybe born deformed? Whatever, whatever sins did a tiny little child ever do to be born this way? Uh, no answer, huh? Well, I'll tell you. Because Christianity does not acknowledge karma, they believe that you can do whatever the hell you want in your life because Jesus has already died for your sins. This is so, so foolish because you might be young and did nothing so bad, but later in life, after you already accepted Jesus, then you could go on doing all kinds of bad things. So karma and reincarnation are very important, valuable things to understand about the cycle of birth and death because the reason that some children are born into such horrible conditions is due to their previous lives and actions. We heard from the other Christian in the other interview or debate that he said the difference between Christianity and other theologies is that 
Christianity is a is instead of other other religions are a do operate on the principle of do and Christianity is done. So the other religions are like do you must do good to reach salvation, liberation and all these, you know, the good the good afterlife. In Christianity, you don't have to do a damn thing because Christ has already died for your sins. So therefore, you just accept Christ, Christ, and that's it. You will go to heaven. It doesn't matter how much more sinning you do. There's no responsibility on your part. So it is very, very flawed, so deeply flawed. You can't even... Uh, any any sane person can see how deeply flawed this mentality is and how such horrible mind control that is to to have people believe that to have people feel this guilt inside them instead of instead of being um instead of living as a child and and praising the world for its beauty and glory and being honoring of oneself and one's soul, which is eternally blissful and full of knowledge. If we are naturally blissful, why should we be put into this negative state of guilt and sin? This so-called sin and guilt just puts fear into people's minds. So out of fear, they are, they are taking on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they're so fearful of what might happen to them even though they've done not much wrong. What is this this whole, you're a sinner, what have I done? Did I go murder someone? Did I go rape someone? Did I kill something? I mean, what did I do? Did I, did I accidentally, you know, knock something over? Um, you know, did I buy the wrong set of clothes for my kids that didn't fit them? Should I be put in hell for this? Most people haven't done things terribly wrong intentionally to the point of where they'd be thrown in jail for it. So this whole thing about punishment, they want to throw that word right all over you. You're going to be punished, punished, punished. So if one just lives righteously, as a lot of other spiritualities promote, do no harm unto others. A lot of spiritualities which Christianity doesn't accept and considers them pagan. Well, a lot of these other spiritualities have a nice moral aspect of do no harm unto others and live in a righteous way. And when you do that, then good things come back to you. Is the karmic reactions, which they do acknowledge, which Christianity doesn't want you to acknowledge because it's all mind control. In order to keep you trapped into their mind control religion, you have to think of yourself as this disgusting, guilty sinner and that your only hope is Jesus. So I pray that all of you get out of this disgusting religion and move on to better spiritual life. Spirituality is very, very personal. Spiritual life is on, a, on an individual basis, and it's very broad and very vast and very it's variegated in how one approaches their spiritual beliefs. And it's not... It doesn't need to come from a book. It doesn't need to come from a religion. It doesn't need to come from any culture. It can just come from within what brings you joy in life. The things that bring you joy and happiness, the things that you honor, the things you respect. There are people that worship so many things as gods or goddesses or higher powers in many different forms, many varieties. Some examples are parts of nature, such as different rocks, trees, stones, 
different planets, different um, elements. There are so many ways of honoring and respecting higher power. It doesn't need to come from some dictating book that tells you that you are a guilty sinner. And, you, and if you don't accept Jesus Christ in your life, you are doomed. You're going to burn in the eternity of hell and never come out. Yeah, they don't want to tell people straight up that. It makes them look bad, doesn't it? Well, perhaps it is bad. 